Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech, Alam, Asher, Bachar, Bachariko, Bina, Atan Lanu, Et Torah To, Baruch atah Adonai, Notein HaTorah. So, we are getting ready for Rosh Hashanah, our final class for this month, for this year of 5783. There's always, I love saying the year, it always reminds me of Stardate, you know, um, watching Star Trek when they would say whatever the year was, and it was so far out in the future, and it made it sound like it was just so far in the future, and I'm like, the Jewish calendar is like, dated, like, like Star Trek. So here we are, star date 5783, soon to be 5784, our final week. And we spoke about last week how last Shabbos, last Shabbos was a Shabbos that was supposed to get, it gave us the potential to correct all the past Shabbos of the year, as well as to launch Shabbos for the coming year, as does each day of the week. So Sunday was a, a possibility to fix all the Sundays of the past year, the Mondays, the Tuesdays, the Wednesdays. I don't know about you, but I actually had more trouble. I think it was like too much pressure on me. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm supposed to be fixing things. And I feel like I didn't even live up to what I normally would have been doing. So anyway, but today we're all gathered together to learn Torah. So that's good. And all of our Torah should be a merit for us individually, for the people, um, our learning impacts, including ourselves and others and all of Am Yisrael, because we are all connected. And just like a an aspen grove, when you nourish one part of it, the nourishment spreads through the root system to all of the trees that are part of that system. So when we are nourished and we are, are moving in a certain direction, we really are bringing everybody else up with us. So God willing, as are we being benefiting from other people who are lifting us as well. So here we are for this final this final week, and we're getting ready to celebrate Rosh Hashanah. And one of the things I always really appreciate learning and enjoy discovering are the questions that I never thought of. Um, having you know grown up Jewish and having grown up celebrating the holidays, and I'm thinking most everybody here grew up celebrating Rosh Hashanah in one way or another. And so we kind of take things for granted. And so it occurs to me, and it occurred to me through looking through a number of different sources, that Rosh Hashanah is actually quite a mysterious holiday. And I wanted to discuss some of those mysterious aspects to it because we take it for granted. And I think if we explore those things, those questions a little more deeply, we'll find additional layers of understanding and insight that we can appreciate. And hopefully we'll make our Rosh Hashanah at least different than it has been in the past and give us something to think about during the long service. Because sometimes, I don't know, when I was growing up, I kind of felt like the rabbis just made a long service to keep you there like all day, that that was like partly the goal without really realizing that there was a reason for uh, why it was structured the way it was. But let's just talk about some basic ideas. If you, everyone knows that the holiday is called Rosh Hashanah, right? It, is anybody, everyone's clear on that? The holiday is called Rosh Hashanah. Let's take a look in the Chumash. There are three places where Rosh Hashanah is mentioned in the Chumash. And let's take a look at them and see what we discover together. Okay. Actually, I take that back. There's only two places. One is in um, Leviticus and one is in Numbers. The first one is on page 687. Switch to that, page 687. We're going to find out about our holiday here. Page 687. Yeah, can this you is tell me the chapter and verse? Yes, I I'll tell you all the chapters and verses for everything. So it's Leviticus chapter 23, verse 23. Chapter 23, 23 verse 23. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. Oh. And if you have the Chumash, it's on page um, 687. Okay, so there we're going to take a look, and this is the first mention, and you'll see if you have the Chumash there, in the margin, it says Rosh Hashanah, okay, so that's very clear. However, if you take a look at verse 23, it says, Hashem spoke to Moshe saying, speak to the children of Israel saying, in the seventh month, on the first of the month, there shall be a rest day for you, a remembrance with shofar blasts, a holy convocation, you shall not do any laborious work, and you shall offer a fire offering to Hashem. What's missing there? 
Rosh Hashanah. Does the word Rosh Hashanah doesn't occur there at all. The only thing that is there is about the shofar blasts and that it is a, a rest day and it's a remembrance with the shofar blasts. And just so we know that the word shofar doesn't actually, ref is not really there either, that that is a translation because the Hebrew says, Yielachem Shabbaton Zichron Teruah. Zichron Teruah. That's the word that's there. The word shofar doesn't appear either. So not only doesn't Rosh Hashanah appear, shofar doesn't appear. It's like, wait, what happened to my holiday? I thought this was like the holiday of Rosh Hashanah and we blow the shofar. But here all we have is no mention of Rosh Hashanah, the name, and no mention either of, of shofar. It just says that it is a Zichron Teruah. Okay, so we want to hold that thought on the Teruah. Let's go to the next place where uh, Rosh Hashanah is mentioned, and that's in Numbers, um, chapter 29, verse 1, page 895, if you're in the Chumash. Take a look at that, page 895. And it says here, chapter 29, verse 1, in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, there shall be a holy convocation for you. You shall do no laborious work. It shall be a day of shofar sounding for you. You shall make an elevation offering, et cetera, et cetera. And then it gives what the offerings are. Again, in the margin, it says Rosh Hashanah. There is no mention of Rosh Hashanah. Not only isn't there mention of Rosh Hashanah, there's no mention of the word shofar either. It is again, it is told, we are told that it is a Yom Teruah. Yom Teruah Yelachem. So now, if we're good sleuths, we're good biblical sleuths here, we want to ask the question, why isn't Rosh Hashanah there? Why is it called a Yom Teruah? And what even is Teruah? Okay, so Teruah might sound familiar to those of you who are used to hearing the shofar blasts. So, but I'm guessing that when you think of Teruah, or when you think of the shofar blasts, that the word teruah is not the word you think of. The word you tend to, t probably tend to think of is what? You can unmute and say if you want. When you think of the shofar, what, what word do you? Like takia gadola? Takia gadola, takia, takia, right? You can ask a preschooler that, okay? A preschooler who's in a Jewish environment. They're gonna know takia, okay, takia. Tekiat shofar, okay? So that is the word that we're used to hearing for the shofar. And yet we know if we're in the synagogue and hear the shofar being blown, that the person who's calling out the shofar um, calls says, Tekia, and the person goes, do, and then they do, shvari, do, 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 and then they say, trua, do, 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 do. So what's trua? Trua is the third of those blows. Right. It's the third of those. The Sorry, second one. I, what is the um, the chapter and, and all that? Because I never found it. Oh, just... chapter 29, verse 1 of yeah, number. okay. numbers. Numbers 29. One. Still trying other... to find it. Okay. Okay. You keep looking and we're going to talk about the show part about the Trua. Okay, right, go. okay. And Leviticus 23, 23 is the other one. And that's where those references are. Those are the references to Rosh Hashanah in the Torah. The word Rosh Hashanah is not there. And Rosh Hashanah itself is cloaked in mystery. And then it's called this other thing called Yom Teruah. So how would anybody know what Yom Teruah means? Like, what does that mean? So we don't even have an explanation of what this Teruah means. We don't have the name of the holiday. We don't have the word shofar. It's like pretty soon it feels like my my holiday is kind of disappearing in front of me. Like this holiday, what is, is there a holiday? Or did somebody just make this up and call it Rosh Hashanah? So we want to understand more about Rosh Hashanah being in the nature of being cloaked and hidden. So what else about Rosh Hashanah is hidden? So one thing that's hidden is last Shabbos. We did not announce the coming of the month of Tishrei. We did not announce that this Friday night is going to be Rosh Chodesh Tishrei. We did not announce that at all. So the month is not announced. Rosh and Rosh Hashanah is, in fact, we aren't even going to observe the Rosh Chodesh aspect of Rosh Hashanah. It's only going to be the fact that it is the new year. But it's interesting because the Torah specifically says it's in the seventh month. 
since when does a new year start in the seventh of something? New year start in the first month. That's like the whole point. And that would be Nissan. So you've got a new year starting in the middle of the year. We're not announcing the fact that it's a new month as well. And we're not going to observe the Rosh Chodesh aspect of it. There's going to be no Rosh Chodesh mention at when you are, go to the synagogue for Rosh Hashanah. And Rosh Hashanah is the only holiday that starts on the, um, that's, okay, okay. Um, Rosh Hashanah is the only holiday that starts on the first of the month. And by starting on the first of the month, it is the only holiday that starts when the moon is not visible at all. The moon is hidden. The name is hidden. The announcement of it is, is hidden. Now, this is all very funny because everyone's been saying, oh, Lashana Tova, have a nice Rosh Hashanah. Like we've been talking about it, but all the physical signs are very hush, hush. It's all under the radar screen. When do we want things to be under the radar screen or when are they under the radar screen? So we want things to be under the radar screen, Darlene. I didn't know, is, is that a question or were you? Uh, go ahead with a yes, go ahead with well, an answer. We don't, I'm just thinking, I'm not sure, but you're going down the track of, we don't want to bring attention to Satan. Uh, this is the time of judgment for us. So let's stay under the radar. Let's not, here I am being judged. What do you have to say about that? You know, you know, where somebody could be, the, Sutton could be the accuser, say, this person did all these things wrong and we're putting up a red flag to say, come and say that about us. Okay, great. So we're going to take that and just shift it a little bit because it's about the Satan. It says, this, we don't want the Satan to really know that it's Rosh Hashanah. It's like, why do we care if the Satan knows it's Rosh Hashanah? So the Satan is the accuser. And it's also the force that opposes whatever is going on. And the force that opposes whatever's going on always matches um, equally the greatness of what's tr trying to come into being. So if something great is coming into being, the opposing force that wants to stop it is going to be equal and opposite. So we don't want there to be something equal and opposite to the greatness of Rosh Hashanah having a lot of attention. So as Darlene said, we wanna like keep things under the radar screen. So what is it that's happening? It says, Hashem is recreating the world. Hashem is recreating us. Hashem is recreating all the potential and possibility that you and I and everyone has. This is a big moment. This is comparable to it says like when um, before a couple gets married, there is a custom for the bride and groom to have a shomer, to have somebody assigned to them, the groom a, a guy and the bride a girl, to kind of keep their eye on them. Why? It's because they're getting ready to get married. And that marriage is a creation. And when something is getting ready that's really profound to happen, little things, big things kind of happen. The big th They kind of obstacles appear. And so the Shomer is supposed to be there just kind of keep their eye on the bride and the groom until they get to the chuppah, safe and sound. It makes being the maid of honor or the best man look like nothing because this is like the whole week before the wedding, they're supposed to be keeping their eye on these people because there is this challenging thing that's happening that's called the Satan, this opposing opposite force. We have that big time when it comes to Rosh Hashanah. Because one of the other aspects of Rosh Hashanah is we talk about the shofar, which again, we said the shofar is not mentioned here, but every day in our da davening, we talk about Takaba shofar gadol, that th there will be a sounding of the great shofar that will herald and announce the ingathering of the exiles and the coming of Mashiach. So when could that happen? It could happen on Rosh Hashanah. If the Satan hears the shofar, like he announces, like the shofar is going to be sounded on Rosh Hashanah and this is this is happening, it gets its energy from knowing that something big is happening. So it's like we keep everything quiet. We're not even announcing that it's a shofar. We're not announcing it's Rosh Hashanah. We're just saying it's a time of a Zikron Teruah. We're going to have this kind of blast. Yes, Patricia. Um, 
what then why do we blow the shofar every day for 40 days before very then? good yes you think like okay so we don't like don't wake them up good question but we do that to wake ourselves up because at, at some point it's like we have to wake up so but we don't want to announce like the big shofar of rosh hashanah because rosh hashanah is the day of creation that is the recreation of humanity that is a big time for the yetzahara to want to get in on that so it's an excellent question, Patricia. So let's talk about another aspect of this idea of keeping things under the radar. Etta, were you going to say something? Yes, I remember when I was pregnant, I was told, don't tell anybody. And I wondered, like, why not? You know, modern scientific person, you are, you ain't. However, there was, um, she, she told me, a, a woman I knew, a spiritual aspect to the fact that something great was happening keep it under the radar because there will there will be there might be problems and only talk about it after a few months exactly right and so some people say oh that's superstitious and above mice and all this stuff it says it's because it's like a pregnancy it says that when there's something going on you know like you just kind of keep those things quiet because it invites this opposing force and again this is it's not it's not considered superstitious. It's considered this is what we do. It says the same thing is true about a project. Now this is hard for me because I get very excited about anything I'm working on and I start talking about it before I've even started doing it. So this is hard for me. But it's like if something really is starting new, just don't you know say little, do much kind of thing. It's like don't don't talk about it so much. Kind of keep it low because when it's talked about, it it raises it ups the ante for the opposing force. And you don't know what that's going to look like. And so it's like, well, just like keep it quiet. I mean, we know people who have been pregnant, women who have been pregnant, and their are uh, are my husband was um, learning with somebody over the phone for a very long time, and they were learning on the phone. He said, "Well, I'm going to have to go early um, because my wife's going to the hospital now. She's going to have a baby." It's like I didn't even know she was pregnant. So it was like, yeah, yeah, you know, like 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 like. So there is that aspect. I certainly would not be able to be in that category. But it says like when something is brewing that's really good, it says like we just kind of keep things uh, low profile on that. And Rosh Hashanah is that because it is a day of such intense spiritual connection and possibility that we keep it low. So then we call it Yom Teruah. So let's just go back. Let's go back to the pregnancy. The Haftorahs and the Torah readings for Rosh Hashanah on the first day. What's the Torah reading for Rosh Hashanah? This is about the birth of Yitzchak. Okay, it's about it's about Isaac, the birth of Isaac, and the Haftorah is about the birth of the prophet Samuel and and Hannah. Okay, so the what we are reading about, which is a big clue big clue as to what is happening is we're talking about a birth experience. So you thought you were going to Rosh Hashanah service just to kind of see all your friends and family. You're actually entering the birthing room. It's like the birthing room of the Jewish people, the birthing room of humanity, the birthing room of each and every one of us ourselves. So when this is happening, it's like this is a very intense and special time. So we keep it under wraps. Now, the reference to these like women and birthing is not just in the Torah reading and the Haftorah, but the very structure, this is one of the questions I put into the email for anybody who read that, um, said, why are there, so that there are, actually, I don't remember if I did put it in the email or not. There are nine prayers that are part of the Musaf service on Rosh Hashanah. It says nine prayers. Normally on a holiday or on Shabbos, you have the three beginning, when we say the, the Amida, the Shemona Esrei, you have three prayers at the beginning, you have three at the end that are the same standard. And then in the center, there is a prayer that's for the, the holiness of whatever the day is. That's the standard Shabbos. That's the standard Yantav. That's how things usually go, except for Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah, you have the three beginning prayers and you have the three uh, one's at the end, and then you have three in the center for a total of nine. And the three in the center are the additions that make the service so long, because that's why it's the longest service of the year, 
is when we talk about Hashem's kingship, about the shofar, and about remembrance. And those nine are create the service that makes it into such a long day. So in the Talmud, in Brachot, it says, why are there nine? Why was it structured like that? Not because the rabbi wanted you to sit there for so long. It says, because it's structured after Chana. It's connected to Chana. And what's the connection to Chana? So let's take a look at it. If you have your Chumash, it's going to be on page 1235 in your Chumash. 1235, and it's from the book of Samuel, um, Dorothy. So I'm not sure if you're going to have that, or if you have a Tanakh, let me tell you. Hold on one second. Get to it. 1235. It is from the book of Samuel, and we're looking at chapter two. It's Samuel 1, because there's Samuel 1 and Samuel 2. It's Samuel 1, chapter two, and it's the verses one through 10. This is Hannah's, Hannah's prayer that she prays after she um, gives birth to, to Samuel. It says, what is this based on? It says, in this prayer, and you can go through and count them, and I double check these because I never believe exactly when people say, oh, it has this many in here. She uses Hashem's name nine times. So the nine times in Hannah's prayer of chapter two, it says Hashem. It opens up with Chana prayed and said, my heart exalted in Hashem. My pride was raised through Hashem, et cetera, et cetera. Verse two, there is none as holy as Hashem. If you go through the prayer, she says his, she says Hashem's name nine times. So it says because of those nine times that Chana says Hashem's name, that's why the Rosh Hashanah service is structured with nine prayers for the Musaf Amida. It's like, talk about the feminine energy that is just completely woven throughout the entire holiday. You've got Sarah, you've got the birth of Isaac, you've got Hannah praying, you've got the entire structure of the Shemona Esrei, the longest service of the entire year, based on Hannah's prayer of how many times she says Hashem in her prayer. So the Yadav might ask a question, what else is nine? So this reminds me of Pesach. What else is nine? If you're doing who knows nine, what's nine? Nine are the? Pregnant month before a baby month? is born. Exactly. Nine are the months of pregnancy. Nine are the months before a baby is born. Eight are the days of pregnancy. Yes, tisha yemei leida. Nine are the months of pregnancy. So this nine is also, when you just hear the number nine, that's already going to tell you we're talking about a pregnancy. We're talking about the pregnancy and birth and rebirth of the Jewish people. And we say, Hayom Harat Olam, today the world is born. And in the preschools or whatever, they make a cake and say happy birthday to the world. And it's it's not um, in the beginning, God created heaven and earth. It's the creation of the world is the creation of humanity, the creation of Adam, Chava. So, so what do we have going on for the Rosh Hashanah for two days? It's a two-day labor and delivery. And who's being born? We are. And all of humanity. And we're saying Hashem, reinvigorate, re ensoul give birth to the world again. And that's the judgment. More so than the judgment on our deeds is the judgment on are wanting to be part of God's new world. It's like, do you want to be part of God's new world? And the only thing that we have to say is yes. We don't even have to say, and I'm really sorry for how poorly things went last year. There's no mention of any sin on Rosh Hashanah. There's no al chaytz. We don't say we're sorry for anything. All we say is we want to be part of your new world. And that's the only thing that we need to say but it's obviously needs to be heartfelt and, and wholehearted. So that's what we're doing with Rosh Hashanah. That's why we have nine. That's why we have this hiddenness. And there's two places in Psalms, or there's one place in Psalms that talks about Rosh Hashanah being hidden. And that's in Psalm 81, verse four. I'm just going to turn to it. Psalm 81, verse four. And you'll see, you'll see it translated 
differently. And here you do see the word shofar. It says tiku vachodesh shofar to blow um, in the month of the shofar. Bakese leyom chagenu. Bakese, that word is, it says when the moon is covered up for our holiday. The word kese means a, a day that is hidden, a day that is undercover, that that's our holiday. It's an undercover holiday. When we have this and we're blowing the shofar, it says that we are announcing that we want to be part of this new creation, this new world that God is bringing into existence. So then what is the shofar for? It says, what is the shofar for? Interestingly, before the shofar is blown in the synagogue, before the shofar service, this you won't have with you unless you happen to have your machzer with you, which I'm assuming you don't. Um, but let me just um, get to it. I forgot to, oh, hold on a second. Before the shofar is blown, the there's a psalm that is read. I'm so sorry, I just forgot to mark it. And as it's min ha meitzar karatik ya from the narrow straits I called upon you. Now that sounds like it should be the narrow straits min ha meitzar. That might sound like Mitzrayim to you, like something that we would say at at Pesach, like you took us out of bondage and you freed us. Min ha meitzar, you you we are calling to you. It says, what does that mean? Min ha meitzar karatiya. I call to God. It says the narrow place. It says the shofar itself represents the narrow place. When, because when? I'm sorry. Ellen, what page in the Moxer is this on? Good question. I'm looking for it. Um, I didn't mark it, Rhoda. I'm so sorry. I meant to do it, but it's I have before. It no, it's in the hallow. It's in the hallow. So look after the look after the benching. Minamit Sa is part of the hallow, and we say that. Okay, but hallow after is the benching, not... don't we? Yeah, we but said hallow... before. Do we say hallow before? Sound There's gone. no hallow at Rosh Hashanah. Hallow is not part of Rosh Hashanah. I'm sorry. I'm thinking of, of the the Haggadah. I apologize. Yes. Right. Yes, that's so okay. It's in the but I did find it here. If you have the art, oh, okay. if you have an art scroll machzer for Rosh Hashanah, it is on page four hundred and thirty-five. Thank you. And it is just so you know there that it is um, the psalm is Psalm one hundred and eighteen. Okay. From the straits did I call upon God. And they're recited responsibly. Sometimes people re re say it like seven times. We say this from the straits that I call upon God. God responded by giving me expansiveness. Okay, so now, if you were going to take what's something that's narrow at one end and expansive at the other, says that would be Darlene. Well, the birth canal coming out. The birth canal coming out exactly. And what in and what in our and what in our service is going to represent that? A show. The shofar represents coming from a narrow place to someplace big, because in order to, and here's what's so interesting. In order to get sound out of a shofar, you have to have the narrow place. Isn't that interesting? So we think like life would be, wouldn't life be bit so much better if it could just all be expansive? It's like it would be expansive, but it actually wouldn't make any sound. The sound comes from having the narrow part at the one end and the expansive part at the other. So I'm saying this specifically to Hashem. So we're getting ready. It's like, wait a minute, what does that have to do with anything? Why am I saying from the narrow straits, I call upon you and you, Hashem, responded by giving me expansiveness. Number one, the first thing, I was born. You took me from a narrow place, says Darlene, said from the birth canal, and I came out into this world. So that represents just at the physical level. But it's also talking about because Minha Metsar, from the straits that I call upon God, those are always referred to as our challenges and difficulties. Minha Metsar, as the word Mitzrayim, from that narrow place. It says, 
God, you have brought me from narrow places in my life that were constricting and difficult and challenging to a place of expansiveness. But the music comes from the fact that I was in that narrow place. I wanted a life that only had expansiveness. I didn't want those narrow places. But that's actually where the music of my life comes from. So just like a birth, which is the most bizarre thing, why does a birth work the way it does? Why isn't there like a zipper? You know, why isn't there something a little bit more convenient? Because of what happened with Eve and the sin in the Garden of Eden, childbirth has to be difficult for us. That is true. However, even before it was not difficult, it still came from a narrow place to expansive place. The baby still had to go through this, this challenging things like for the baby's sake. Now I know physiologically there's all these things happen and it pushes the fluid out, et cetera, et cetera. But you can't say it exactly makes the most sense. Um, so it says, because this is a metaphor for our life, that life is going to be a series of these narrow places and coming through into an open, expansive area. And it's like, and Hashem is bringing us through. So the shofar on Rosh Hashanah is describing this, bringing us through this narrow space and coming out in the act of just being born, but also then as a, like a boilerplate message for how life is going to be. It's like, I'm in a narrow spot. I am in a constricted spot and I'm davening for a place of expansiveness. And that's one of the prayers that we're supposed to pray for on Rosh Hashanah during the shofar blast is that Hashem should bring us from narrow places to expansiveness. Us, we as individuals, people we love, the Jewish people, the land of Israel, all of humanity, because that expansiveness represents clarity, openness, being able to breathe freely and having everything be all right. This is, and this is why the shofar is one of the reasons like we can understand why it would be associated with the coming of Mashiach. Why do you, if you wanna just make noise, so make noise with something else. Why is it a shofar? The idea of like, because it represents this, this process of going from someplace narrow to someplace wide. And as I said, with this psalm, it's repeated. Most most of the congregations, at least we did, we always, yeah, um, read them aloud. It says, we always did it seven seven times, whatever. Okay, meet ha Metzar. And then it says, the rest of the prayer is, you have heard my voice. Do not shut your ear from my prayer, for my relief when I cry out. Uh, your very first utterance is truth and your righteous judgment is eternal. Your servants guarantor for good. Let not willful sinners exploit me. I rejoice over your word like one who finds abundant spoils. Teach me good reasoning and knowledge for I believe in your commandments. Please accept with favor the offerings of my mouth, Hashem, and teach me your judgments. So that this is, that we say this seven times. We repeat this over every individual seven times. When you do something seven times, that means I think you really mean it. It's like you really, really mean it. So that this is what we should have. Patricia, you look like you might have a question. No, okay. Does anybody else have a, a question? Darlene. Well, you just mentioned um, seven times and that it's that um, Rosh, Rosh Hashanah occurs in the seventh month. So mm. the significance of seven, the seventh day is our beloved Shabbos. The seventh month is our beloved first, the Rosh Hashanah and just, Seven times, it's really, it's a very beloved position. Very nice. Beautiful. That's so great. I didn't come up with it. I'm just another sheer. <laughs> Trust me, I didn't come up with it. Okay. Wherever you got it, I love it. So thank you. Yes, great. All those sevens. And, you know, these sevens are going to be repeated because then we're going to go for Rosh Hashanah and then we're going to go to Yom Kippur and then we're going to go to Sukkot and we're going to have seven days and we're going to have the seven marches and seven hakafot and Simchas Torah and we're going to be seven, 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 seven until we are like topped out on the sevens. This is, and this is, so that's a great, great insight is the 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 seventh month there being so, so special um, as far as celebrating the creation of humanity. And again, mind you, it's all of humanity. It's not the Jewish people. Jewish people are created in the first of Nisan, Nisan with Pesach. All of humanity is created on, on Rosh Hashanah. That's really the, our, the most 
ecumenical of all holidays is really Rosh Hashanah, the creation of humanity. So now we want to talk about this trua. What is this trua about? And why don't we don't even see the word shofar? We don't see the word tekiah. We don't see the word shfarim. So I'm assuming that when I made my imitation of the shofar sounds, that those sounded familiar to you. Tekiah, tuvu, shfarim, tu, 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 trua, tu, 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 tu. So it's like, why do we have all those different sounds? So it says that the shofar is also related, we talked about last week, to the word, the, the shipur, which means, le shaper means to improve. And it, it, that improvement is the improvement that comes from doing teshuva. And teshuva, returning to our truest selves, returning to our truest selves. How does that work? How does somebody end up wanting to do that, doing it? Like, what's the method? We talk about, as Patricia mentioned, the wake-up call from Rosh Chodesh Elul. Why are we making so much noise? It's like we're trying to wake up and to wake ourselves up to make that journey back to ourselves. We don't need to go someplace new. We need to go back to where we came from. It says, how does that happen? So the rabbis were very concerned. And you might think, like, why is there a concern? Just do a tekiah. Why do we have to have all these different kinds of different sounds? So it says, oh, well, the shvarim sounds, and the word um, shvarim comes from the word to be broken, which is why the sound sounds like do, do, do. It's like a broken sound. It says that those are supposed to be sounding like moaning, ha, 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 like that. And the trua is supposed to sound like, ah, 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 ah. Now, unless this was a therapy session where you're trying to say like, well, I need to know, are you moaning and groaning or are you whimpering or are you crying and sobbing uncontrollably? It's like, does it really matter? Like, can't we just have the sound of the shofar and be illuminated? This is what these different sounds are telling us are different ways that people wake up. Because if you say the shofar is a wake up, it has to be more than the fact that it's loud, right? If I want to just have loud noise, so let me put on a song and, and sing something loud. But these are specific sounds that represent different kinds of awakening. It says, what's the awakening? It says the tekiah sound is the sound of pure connection of us and our neshama. It's how we started out. Do straight line connection. That's good. Some people maybe can just wake up just by hearing that and like, oh, right, I'm in a shama. I forgot. Some people are moaning and groaning when they realize that their life has taken a turn and they've fallen into, I'm going to call them intellectual traps that have gotten their thinking off track from a track of God, Torah, and Judaism. And it's that moaning of like, oh, I can't believe this. I did this. I can't believe I was living my life. What a waste. It's that sound. Ah, ah, ah. And then sometimes it comes from pain. The pain that comes to somebody from the mistakes that they've made, where it comes back and bites them. And then it's like, ah, 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 I can't believe it. this is like terrible. That kind of emotional says the trua represents the emotional reaction. The shvarim represents the intellectual thinking. And the tikiya is the straight, just neshama. So that's why they wanted to have all three. Because what's the path? Probably it's going to be all three. And everyone's going to resonate more with one or the other. But you have to have all three. Because you think, seriously, don't you have something else better to talk about than what the sounds have to sound like? And it's interesting, musically, if you've ever been in a synagogue um, where they've been blowing the shofar and the person who's calling out the notes, there's an act, there is an exact musical beat for it. It has to have whatever it is, I forgot the, the count, like nine counts or whatever, and the truas have to equal the shvarims. So it can't be like, oh, there's more trua than shvarim and more shvarim than trua. It has to be the same. Or they have you do it over again. So you think like, see, like, 
are the Jewish people crazy? Like they have to make such a big deal out of everything? It's like, yes, because we're talking about that this is the symbol. This is what this holiday is called, is the remembrance of this blowing, these blasts of the truah. So the question is, what does truah sound like? It might be a shvarim we're talking about. Is it a moaning of an intellectual ive, that kind of, or is it coming from total pain? Or we have the tekiah, and how does it, how does it always end? After the end of the, the shofar blast, what do we always end up with? Tekia Gedola. The Tekia Gedola represents the end game. In the end, we will be back to where we started from. In the end, we will have clarity and the connection between ourselves and our neshamas and Hashem will be straight line, yashar, everything connected. And the Tekia Gedola, by definition, must then be longer than the shvariums or the truas or any of those other things. It has to represent the longest because that represents the final destination. That's where we're going. And I don't know about you, but as a kid, or even as an adult, you kind of sit there and you kind of hold your breath while the, the person blowing the shofar blows and you hope for like a really long tekia gadola. And that's what that represents. So this is what we're talking about, about this, the shofar and why it has to have all these different sounds, because it's telling us what the path is back to our, what the path is to our teshuva. So then going back to what Patricia said about the blowing of the shofar during Elul, and they blow each of the notes a little bit of them, those like mini versions of each of those sounds to remind you like, what's your wake up call? I don't know, how do you like to wake up? What things have impacted you? How have you woken up in the past and made a change in your life? What has done it? Was it an intellectual thing that's like uh, an aha moment? Or was it a place of pain where you realize like I am on the wrong track here? Or was it simply that you were able to get in touch with your neshama in some way that you had clarity? So those are the three ways. And the shofar has to represent that because it needs to represent for all the different kinds of ways that people get themselves back to where they're supposed to be. So that's the path of our shofar with each of those different sounds and why it's calculated so carefully and why it's described so in depth and why it be, serves such a central function um, in our Rosh Hashanah service. Any questions just about that? And again, something to think about when you're hearing those sounds of, you know, who am I in here? Yes, Darlene, go ahead. I'm not trying to be obnoxious. I I just um, had the opportunity to hear other share. Great. So there, um, this really is another layer upon exactly what you're saying, but there was an association with the Kia with Abraham, that Abraham was like, he went through a lot of trials, but it was straight. It was always believing in Hashem, just straight, long, and whereas... Um, Shavarim and Teru were kind of compared to Yitzhak and Yaakov, who also had lots of trials and tribulations, but our goal is to kind of be Yashar like Abraham. So it was, it was a nice, you know, layered on Very the nice. Very nice. And there's another, uh, Mel, there's another thing also that talks about, that says that the three represent the three phrases that we have Hashem Malach, Hashem Melech, Hashem Yimloch. Hashem Malach, that God was king. Hashem, um, Yim, uh, Hashem Melech, Hashem is king. And Hashem Yimloch, Hashem will be king. And those are represented by each of the sounds as well. But it says there in this one, in this analysis, it says that the first Tekia is that Hashem, Hashem Malach, that Hashem was king, has been king, was king, that that's clear. And we know that in the future, and this is going to go to the Tekia Gedola, that, that, that Hashem will be king. And again, we have with the coming of Mashiach and the shofar blast. Our challenge is in the Trua and the Shvarim. It's like, what do we do between then and now? It's like, okay, I believe God created the world. God created everything. And I believe that it's all going to work out. But this period that we're going through now, it's it's broken. It's breaking me. I'm crying. I'm moaning. I'm groaning. I don't know what to do with that. 
says that this kind of the shvarim and trua is a other way because trua is also represented is also connected to the word to to break something to tear something and it says and this is the challenge of like how do we navigate life at the, in between the time when we don't have the the tekiah gadola it's like i haven't heard it i'm not seeing it so this brings us to the last piece, which is there is a very interesting, again, cryptic message. It's also, it's part of the davening, but it's also from Psalms. And it is Psalm 89, verse 16. Psalm 89, verse 16. And hold on a second. You won't have that in your, unless you happen to have it in front of you, uh, a book of Psalms, 89, 16. And it says... It's interesting how things get translated. So I have a Koran, uh, beautiful Koran translated um, to Helim. So yours might say something different, but the um, verse 16 of to Helim uh, 89, verse 16 says, Ashrei ha'am, happy is the people, Yodei Teruah, who know Teruah, Hashem be'or panecha yehalechon. In the, they walk in the light of your countenance. Now mine is translated, happy is the people who know how the joy, who know how the joyful sound. It's like, that's not what it says. It says the word, it says yodei teruah. Happy is the people that knows teruah. They walk in the light of your countenance. It says, it doesn't say happy is the people that blows Teruah. It doesn't say happy is the people that hears Teruah. It says happy is the people that knows Teruah. So it's like, what does that mean to know? To, oh, I know. You know what? I know Teruah. It's like, what does that mean? It says to know Teruah means a couple of things. Knowing it on one hand, first of all, knowing something, anytime we see that in Torah, to know something means to be able to experience it, that I experience it and know it. Um, it's the word that is used in the in the Torah to describe intimate relations between a man and woman as he he knew her. It means I experienced I experienced it. Um, I experienced it. So it says I know Teruah. It's like what does that mean? I know that brokenness and that I really it looks broken, but I know that I'm really walking in the light of God. I know that God's light is there even when I'm walking in a world that looks broken because all of us can point to any number of things in our immediate environment, the community, the world that are so broken. And they would say like, where's God? It says God's light is there. And a person who knows Teruah knows that this is the stage of creation where we're going through a process and the God's light is there. And that person is joyful because they know it. So it says, joyful is the person who knows, is the people that knows Trua. They walk in the light of God's countenance. The final piece on that Trua is, it says Trua is the ability to, to break up, to, uh, to tear away. And it says, what is it tearing away? It says it's the ability to tear away judgment against the Jewish people. It says, if we would know how much power our prayers have for God to get rid of the any bad judgments against us and turn things around, we would realize we would be, we would have a different approach and we would have a different attitude and we could walk in God's light and feel a sense of confidence, but that we would devote ourselves to much, much more tefillah. You might want to consider before you go into your Rosh Hashanah davening, actually writing out a list, writing out because sometimes during Rosh Hashanah, you can't think of it. You're distracted, you know, whatever's going on. You're seeing people you haven't seen for a while. What page are they on in the Moxer? I don't like how the cantor's singing. I do like how the cantor's singing. Whatever it is that's going on in our heads that's getting in the way of us actually experiencing Rosh Hashanah, let's make a list of what you want to daven for. The day won't even be long enough, the two days of all the things, very, very specific things. Because what do we also have is from Hannah. It says, why do we have Hannah's prayers? Like, why do we pick Hannah? You know, there are other women who were barren. There were other people. 
Like, why is she the focus here? We're going back to our nine times that Hashem's name was mentioned, and she's the Haftorah. Like, why is it around Hannah? It's this really interesting understanding. It says that Hannah from birth was someone who would never be, who was barren, who would never be able to have a child. She would never be able to have a child. She prayed so hard and so fervently that Hashem changed nature to make that happen. As did Sarah. So Sarah, some say that it wasn't that just that she was old, it said that she was barren. Some say she didn't even have a womb and that God miraculously restored her a womb to her and made her fertile so that she had a baby. It wasn't just a long-term fertility issue. She was not able to have a child. Hannah, not able to have a child. You say, like, why did why did Hannah want a child? We know how badly Sarah wanted to have a child, so much so that she was willing to have her husband Abraham marry Hagar to have a child like a surrogate child. So she was willing to do that. It wasn't Abraham who said that she should do that. It was her idea. And we know that Hannah wasn't the reason she wanted a child. It's like, well, women weren't valued if they didn't have ch children. We have her husband, Manoach's famous. Famous lines of like, aren't I as good to you as 10 sons? And every and people always laugh at that. It's like, no, because she wanted a child. No, you're not the same. You're like, you're not as good as 10 children. She wanted a child because she wanted a child to be able to be, a, to serve Hashem. Because what does she do? She promises if she has a child, she will turn him and dedicate him to him to God for the rest of his life. And he becomes the prophet Samuel, who reaches the same level of greatness as Moshe and Aaron and Aaron. So it says her prayers were so fervent and so focused, but we have to learn from hers. Why did she want to have a child? It wasn't to go to baby gap. She wanted to have a child so that she could dedicate him to Hashem. Why do we want what we want? Why do we want even to be healthy? Why do we want to even have food on the table? Why do we want to have our home? Why do we want to have good health? Says, because I can serve you, Hashem, in your new world you are creating for this coming year. I want to be in your world and I want to serve. And the more comfortable I am, the better job I will do for you. Says, this is the prayer of Chana is that, yes, I'm praying. It's not just like, oh, it was a real heartfelt prayer. Heartfelt can be still for the not as pure reasons. Her prayer was at, for such pure reasons and that her prayer made her son into who he became. It says he became the person she prayed for because he was dedicated for his whole life, even after he even after he went through his initial educational period of time, it's kind of like you said, if you promise the university, I will send my kid to your school. It's like, okay, great. So they go to the school and afterwards they couldn't care less. It's like, she will devote him to Hashem. And it wasn't just a promise. It was a, it became emblazoned on his soul and he served the Jewish people for his entire life. So that's the kind of prayer we want. I want my prayers to be, I want my prayers to be like that. And anything we have, we can make, we can understand that it is all, all in order to serve Hashem. So what does it mean to serve Hashem? It doesn't mean I go stand in the shul every day. It means that my home is like my food. It's open to other people that, you know, that, um, you know, this sounds really funny, but, you know, one of the reasons I, I, had braces as an adult. I don't know if you, you all remember. It wasn't so long ago, but I had Invisalign. And I was so happy because I was always so self-conscious about my smile because my teeth were crooked. So now one of the things I love to do is to smile at people because I know that my teeth are straight. <laughs> so it's like, Hashem. And people tell me like, you, it's so nice. You always smile. And someone here, I think I've told you this, like, it's so nice because you always smile at people. It's like, just because I had an invisible line and I don't have to feel self-conscious. So it's like, okay, so Hashem, give me thousands of dollars to pay for orthodontists so that I can have a nice smile to smile at people. So whatever it is that we want, that we need, and that we feel that would enhance our lives is all, all fair game. And it's like what we want. Hannah didn't need to have a child. It wasn't because she needed someone to take care of her in her old age. It wasn't so that her husband would love her more. It wasn't so that, you know, she would have status in the community. She wanted 
to have him so that she could devote him to Hashem. So it says, I want what I want, even not that I need it, I want it, and I want to be able to use it in a way that furthers God's will in this world. And God's will has lots of forms. I mean, you know, any skill or trade, um, especially being here in Israel where you have workers who are Jewish workers who are religious who come with their kippah and their tzitzis and everything and they're, they're, they're the electrician or they do the put in the glass or they are the plumber or whatever is like this is all serving Hashem because when people can live comfortably without floods in their basements and without with their light fixtures working and you know their plumbing and everything else being okay this is furthering Hashem's world it says as we go through Rosh Hashanah to really think about what is it I'm praying for why do I want the things that I want? How is it going to help serve Hashem? And it should and can almost anything that we would want that would be legal, moral, and ethical can serve Hashem. And that way we can have ask for that for this coming year. We do not say to Hashem, you know, I, I, I know I did a bad job last year. It's like Hashem's like, I don't want to hear about it. So we don't even talk about sin. We talked about this before, that some people don't eat nuts because the um, gematria of nuts is the same as sin, is the same as chet. And that chet is like, not only do I want to stay away from sin, I don't even want to talk about it. So I don't even want to, I don't even want to say the word nuts. I don't want to eat nuts because I don't even want to think about sin because it's not on the agenda for Rosh Hashanah. I do like nuts, but anyway, so... Which says like we're not talking about that. So this is the day where we go back to our birth, just like how a parent feels like when a child was born. God willing, how your parents felt when you were born, you were perfect as is. And nobody was talking about anything. I don't think if you know if you were a hard labor and delivery. I don't think your mommy yelled at you and said you've already given me so much trouble so far. It's just like the fact that you came through the you came into this world. That's all. That was, that was the joy. This is the joy of Rosh Hashanah is the joy of coming into God's world for the year 5784 and it should be filled with blessing. And whatever our path of return to Shuva is, is whether it is an intellectual, I can't believe it, or we come through some painful, painful experience and we realize we need to get ourselves back together. Or, you know, you get up on the first, uh, the wake up call and your neshama is just, awakened um, just as soon as it hears that first takia, but that eventually we'll all hear the takia gadola. We'll hear that great sound of the great shofar, and then it'll all be clear. The forces of the opposing forces will have been dealt with, and we will all emerge into a perfected world that God can be proud to have created. So with that, I want to wish you, it should be a shana tova umetuka. Now, I know I'm just going over a little bit, but I just want to emphasize here that it is a custom to do things on Erev Rosh Hashanah, on Rosh Hashanah night. Um, they're called simanim. And these are signs of things that have to do with brachas that you want to have in your life. You can go in your machzor, and there's a list of traditional ones. I'm guessing everyone is familiar with apples and honey. Why do you have apples and honey? Yehi ratzon, that it should be, that God should make your year, shana tova umetuka. Do you take a sweet fruit and dip it in honey? And apples don't need honey. But this was like, no, we want it to be really sweet. Sweet, good year. But there are a whole lot of other things as well, and they're all plays on words. And you can make up your own. So you can make up your own. We were talking to our kids today when we were there. So um, there's a phrase uh, in, what they did is they decided, what they wanted to serve their kids that the kids like to eat and then figured out some sort of pun that went with it. So they get to have Coca-Cola, which is not usually on the list for a meal. So the word cola, so using the phrase, it says that they should be blessed to learn um, kol, ha, kol ha Torah kula, which means all of the Torah in its entirety. So kula kind of sounds like kola. I mean, you can be pretty like not exact with these things. So that will be their blessing to them. Like l'chaim on your Coca-Cola, you should learn kol ha Torah kula. So if you're having guests and they say, what can I bring? Say, bring something funny. 
um, to go with whatever. You can tell them what your menu is, let them come up with puns or let them bring something. It can be a fruit, it can be a vegetable. Somebody, you know, you can have carrots. You can say, I care a lot about you. I mean, it can be like stupid things that you would see like, you know, on a bubble gum wrapper that like don't really make so much sense. But what's the idea? Why do we go to such an effort? We go to an effort because we just want to infuse the holiday with as many blessings and prayers and wishes for everyone around us, for ourselves and everyone, as many as we can think of. And we usually don't do that. We usually don't have that as a thing in our holidays that you add all this other stuff. In fact, about the holidays, you can't add those kinds of things. But this specifically for Rosh Hashanah, we do. So be creative. Yes, Susan, did you have a question? First then. Oh, sorry. Oh, no. Yeah, I can hear you. You can. Okay. Is, is there a list somewhere of some of those possibilities that we could draw um, on? You said carrots, but yeah, particularly carrots. the English English ones. So there's English ones. You might be able to Google them and see. Carrot actually happens to be one in Hebrew as well because her carrot in Hebrew is gezer. And it's related to the word gezera, which means a, dec a bad decree. So it says like Hashem should, ter should tear up all the gezeras, all of the decrees against the Jewish people. Um, but you might be able to just Google and say fun simanim mm -hmm. in English. Um, and and simanim. Okay. simanim, right? A siman is a like is a sign or a symbol for something. A very um, popular one is eating raisins on celery to get a raise in salary. Yes. So that's a cute one. Take celery and you put some peanut butter on it and some raisins, and so I would like to get a raise in salary. I heard one today about kohlrabi. Call everything you can read from your everything you can learn from your rabbi. Give your kids kolarabi. 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 Everything from kolarabi. listen to the kol the, the voice of your rabbi. Kolarabi. But you can and just be just, creative. Yes, Gabby. I just sent the simon name uh, uh, one that is all in one postcard. If you can uh, forward it to Susan, I don't have her email right now. Sure. I don't see. Thank it. you. I will be happy to send that. And it's also if you have a machzer, it's in the machzer as well. Um, the standard ones. Let's see, Arab Rosh Hashanah. Um, let's see, significant omens. It's on page 96 in the Art Scroll um, Moxer, and it has all of them. Um, but they're based on they're based on the Hebrew words. But there's like carrots, cabbage, beets, dates, gourd, pomegranate, fish, head of a sheep, the fish. Um, and you can use candy. Like some people are like, I'm not serving a head of a fish. So they get like little fishies, like the little um, gummies. And they just cut off the head and just serve the, the, the head of the gummy. So, but go online also and just look up for funny things, a funny simonim. It's a good way to engage people. And it's also serious too, um, because sometimes people are feel awkward like giving blessings for what they want they don't know exactly what to say so it's almost like having a prop um to to work with so you should all have a good sweet happy healthy year and we should all be blessed to come together again next week i hope i recognize you as newborns um you know we'll we'll see um how we all look as in our renewed our renewed state of ourselves and Hashem should renew the world and bring it to ultimate conclusion and fruition immediately so that we can only just go enough with the trua. Let's have, let's have a tequila gadola. And then we'll be. Amen. 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 Uh, Ellen, Ellen, I'm sorry. Did you say, um, I remember the two, the trua is the neshama pure with God and the other two, which one is intellectual, which one is, Emotional. The tequila is the straight connection to Hashem. Oh, the tequila is straight to Hashem. Hashem. Yes. Okay. The tequila is straight. The shvarim is the moaning, groaning. That's intellectual. And the trua is the emotional, like in pain, just sobbing. And you're right. It's nine staccatos. Yes, because sometimes nice to do eight and it's nine. 
It's nine. It's nine. So it's interesting. Um, Steve did that last uh, a year ago at I think it was a year ago at Dot. He was the shofar caller, and he practiced. And Re and um, Rabbi Friedman was doing the davening, and he's yeah. very and he's a musician, and he was like. No, he was doing something. You know, I don't even remember. Whatever. He rehearsed it. He rehearsed it because it needs to be exact. You think like, what is the big deal? You know, you don't do that like on New Year's, you know, blow your heart. Oh, let, no, you blew that too long. Do it again. It's like, no, this is and, this is conveying something that's very significant. And what what did you say that the trua has to last as long as the... The shvarim. Shvarim. Has to last as long. Last as long. Mm-hmm. So the, the trua is the nine staccatos, and the shvarim is how many? Three? Three. Three longer ones. Yeah. And shabbos uh, from being, uh, okay. Uh, da, 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 yeah. 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 So, it, and it's because it's, you know, these things, sometimes people think like, oh, you know, what are they doing? What's the big deal? But it's like, this is conveying a message. And the message is we want to make sure is going in. It's like, well, if nobody knows what the message is, how are they getting the message? It's like, you know, some things are, you don't even have to know why something works. It's like if you hear, if you go to a movie and you hear like the scary music that makes you close your eyes before you even see what's on the screen, do you know musically why it scares you? It's like, I couldn't tell you. All I know is it does. Like, I don't have to, I don't have to have an intellectual understanding of it. I know that when I hear certain musical patterns, I'm going to like get the shivers and close my eyes. So it says, you don't have to, you don't have to understand everything in order for it to have an impact. But I find it really interesting when we do. And that when we yeah. do, then it just adds more to it to help us appreciate it and understand it more and relate to it on a deeper level. Right, probably the composers do know. Oh yes, for sure composers know, for sure composers know, but the audience doesn't know what the musical, you know, they don't know like, oh, if it's a White. fifth or a fourth or what, they don't know any of that. They just know what it, what it feels like and that there's a human reaction. And it's not like, oh, well, in some cultures, people think that sounds good. It's like, no, when people hear that sound, it gives them the willies um, because that's just the nature of it. So anyway, that's just my, as a, an example that you don't have to know why something right. works. It's like with design, if you see something and it looks good, you don't necessarily know why. That's why it, that's why you hire designers. Like I know it looks good, but I don't know why it looks good and I don't know how to duplicate it, but I know what it feels like. And I know what, when I see it, I know it. Um, so this is like, this is registering. The sound of the shofar is registering at a subliminal level. So um, there was a story, this was in a book about from actually a rabbi who lives here and the Yeshuv wrote about Rav Cook, and he told the story about, uh, he was, um, what's the name he, of the book? Oh, it is called Silver from the Land of Israel. Yeah, because my, my friends are from the Rav Cook, like a Dayan. Oh, uh, oh, Rav yes. So it's in Jerusalem. Rabbi Rabbi Hanan Morrison, um, and he wrote this this um, sefer. And one of the things that he does is he, I'll tell you this story here. Hold on one second. Uh, Hanan Morrison. Uh, Hanan Morrison, yes. And it's called and the he, silver, the silver what? It's just called silver from the land of Israel. Because we need Rav Cook right now to bridge between them, um, everyone. That's that's how the government uh, communicated between secular and religious in the past. And we don't have Rav Cook today, and we need him back. Yeah, he would be a uh, he would be great for okay, uniting. So I can't find his story, but what he tells the story of is that there were some people who were oh maybe it's here awakening. Um, oh, here it is. Um, this was the wake up call. It says it was in one of the neighborhoods in Yerushalayim, a group of workers was under pressure to complete a particular building and they continued working during the Rosh Hashanah holiday. It says when the neighbors realized what was happening, they immediately notified Rav Cook. 
Um, shortly thereafter, a messenger of the Rav arrived at the construction site with a shofar in hand. He approached the workers who were surprised to see him and they offered, and he offered New Year's greetings like Lashana Tova. He then announced that Rav Cook had sent him to blow the shofar for them in accordance with the obligation to hear the shofar in Rosh Hashanah. He respectfully asked them to just take a break from their work and listen to the shofar. The messenger then proceeded to recite the blessing and began to blow. It says the words from the Rav and the sounds of the shofar achieved their goal. Each blast shook the delicate cords of the soul and awakened the Jewish spark in the hearts of the young workers. They set down their work tools, gathered around the man blowing the shofar. Some were so moved that they began to cry. The ancient blast of the shofar reverberating an unfinished building transported them back to their father's house. Um, questions began to pour out one after the another. What has happened to us? Where are we? What have we come to? The young men stood around the emissary, confused and absorbed in thought. When the shofar blowing was over, there was no need for words. The workers unanimously decided to stop working. Some asked the messenger if they could accompany him. They quickly changed their clothes and joined in the holiday prayers at Rav Cook's yeshiva. It's like, they didn't have to amazing. say anything. That's amazing. The, the shofar the, speaks the, heart to heart. It says sometimes yeah. it's like, you know, the Hasidic thing of a niggin. Sometimes words get in the way. Sometimes yeah. you just need a sound. And the sound right. of the shofar is like just penetrates. It's, just, it's not just that it's loud. It's that it goes to a place in us that is in above and beyond. In the heart. Yeah. Uh, Rabbi Barami says that uh, showed us how uh, the name of Hashem is in, in every, in the shofar, in many combinations. Hidden, not hidden. Um, there is ways to do the right shin, then shin vav, then shin vav pei. I sent you the whole thing. Uh, so, Thank so you. The name and it's all over the shofar. I never. I look at the shofar now, and I'm like, oh, it has the name of Hashem. It really changes. Hashem. Changes so all this. All these things change everything, and it's something. It's you know, it's such a primitive thing. You think like, well, can't we just like get past this and go out and get some sort of silver trumpet or something? It's like, nope. Not it's a good like, idea. This has. This has a. This has a power to a primordial power to it. And when we hear the shofar, not only does it take us to just what it's signifying for Rosh Hashanah, it takes us back to Har Sinai as well, because the shofar blast was then also. Right. And it's also for Mashiach. So it takes us in time beyond what we personally think we remember in time. Um, and it's, you know, it's hard to know. It's like, have you heard something so often that you think you remember it? Or do you actually remember it? So I don't know if I shared this with you when we were with our kids, when, when we were babysitting our grandchildren, Benjamin and Dahlia had gone to England for a wedding and we babysat one night with our kids. And the activity was watching the, watching the video from Benjamin and Dahlia's wedding. The kids love watching that. So the five-year-old Shana, she was especially enjoying it. They, they all were. And I said, oh, it's such, you know, I was just kind of kidding around. I said, oh, it's so, it's such a shame that you weren't, that you couldn't be at mommy and Tati's wedding, which of course they couldn't be. She goes, oh no, I was there. I said, you were? I said, where were you? She goes, I was standing in the corner. And I'm like, you know what? I don't know. Maybe she was. And um, they talk oh, yeah. about that, that the, that the deceit, if the bride and groom's parents are deceased, it says that they come to the wedding that they are there. So if the people from the past are there, why not the people from the future coming there too? It was like souls don't know a boundary of, of, of a body. It's like, maybe she was there. What do I know? So I said, well, I didn't say, oh no, that you're so silly. I said, I said, oh, I said, I didn't see you. <laughs> I didn't see you. <laughs> that, that's amazing. That's a and great answer. Like, oh, I was there. I was there. No question. She was, so, she's, she was five when she said that? She's five. Yeah, this was like a few weeks ago. She's five. That, um, that's, so. amazing. that's a pure neshama because my friend uh, told us that the little one, but she was like three or two. She said um, to mommy, I'm so happy I chose you. So she was very little, but she could speak. Uh, so she's got she, that right. It, she lost she it. Later, so she says, what do you mean? And she said, yeah, you were in a circle. 
and I chose you, and I'm so happy. Oh, that gives what me do chill. we know? What do we know? We're told that. We're told that is that we agree that Hashem is a neshama, and we agree to come into the family we come into. We agree. Wow. So it's like I didn't mean it. <laughs> I take that back. It's like no, we agree. Ellen, yes. That's I, thank you so much for your class. My daughter is studying in Israel at seminary. Are you Yay. wonderful you to host guests? If I give it your number to call to come for Shabbat, if not, it's okay. I just want to ask. Yes, yes, please. Where is she studying? Midrash at Oh, Selena, you didn't come through clearly, so please send me uh, an email, and we would love to have a, have her as a guest. You're, you're breaking like the staccato one. What is that one? The draw. <laughs> okay, breaking, thank you. Breaking. Yeah, but be in touch with me. That would be lovely. So, so okay, as, ladies. So for a message, right. for if I give a message and beautiful class, so many books. beautiful, so beautiful. Like like if you summarize about the shofar, and then I. Rabbi Lieben was here taking mezuzot out because it's time to check. And with the pandemic, I forgot. I'm sure I'm not the only one. I know it's twice in seven years, but that didn't happen. And I feel it's urgent. So I'm very sorry I missed the beginning. Um, do you mind just telling me? I know that I heard all about the shofar, but the beginning, was it about birth or I just missed it? I'm so about sorry. birth, about the shofar being birthed from Minha Meitzar Karatika, from a narrow place I call to you of the birth of canal of being like a narrow place and coming out into open, but it also represents being in narrow places in our own lives and coming out into the open. And the that the sound is created by the narrow place that um, we, we wish it would all just be like this, but you don't get any, if you just go, you don't get any sound coming from a a wide open place. You only get a sound from a narrow place that opens up um, and that that's where the music is. Right. And someone told me yesterday, oh, Aliza Bilo, that the shofar, the way it looks, um, and we are like with too many challenges lately, uh, everyone I'm sure, because Mashiach is coming maybe, I don't know what's going on, but just read the news. So the narrowness, and then it uh, turns around the shofar, uh, so not only that it's expansive and then what's good news and uh, not narrow anymore, but also that you cannot see the other side of our future. Ooh, I but like that. Everything will be okay because, if I understood right, because it's uh, bigger and expansive in the end because it has a twist. I love that. I have Something twist. Like that. That and or like even, is, even is um, a, a bend. So you can't see around the bend either, even if it doesn't That's twist. Can see. So you're, the separate. ideal is to have a shofar that's not totally straight. Um, and right. part of okay. it is about anava of you know of being a humble, a humble place. The shofar, um, but it's also like what you just said is beautiful idea about you can't see the end. We know it's there, and the we other know it's step. the yeah, other right. You can't see the other end. You can't. See the other you can, end. You can yeah. hear it, but I can hear it, but I can't see it. So, which is interesting, like, I can hear, you know, Mashiach is coming, but I, I can't see it yet. But I trust it's there because I heard it. It's like, if you hear a train whistle, it's like, you wouldn't say, oh, well, there's no train because I can't see it. You'd be like, get off the tracks because the train's coming. I hear it. So um, you would take that seriously. Beautiful. So that's what I missed. Anything else the first day? Uh, I don't know. Um, there probably the more oh, you said seven, you said seven 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 something with sevens i know yeah. that's com complete but complete you said seven. love something about love um i didn't say love but just about completion so shabbat is seven and then seven that it's a seventh oh, month what darlene said a beloved a beloved number beloved number because seventh month is seventh tishrei. month is, is tishrei and we have the and, seventh day is shabbos you yeah. will have the seven days of Sukkot and the seven Hakafot, and we'll have all those sevens. Okay, thank you so much. I love thank that you. everybody's going to so many great classes and sharing what you're adding in, what you're learning. It's great. Yeah, well, she just called me. Um, she just called me, and uh, and I I needed something, and she gave me this inspiration. Wonderful. She wanted to give me a cake. 
a cake, but I had to say, what does it have? And Yoni is allergic to almonds. So I said, you have to give it to someone else, but give me something spiritual, much better than dessert. <laughs> and uh, I got the shofar, so better than All cake. Right. I love it. Yeah. So good luck All with right. your, that's like how with your first Rosh Hashanah, but I did, so like a vod. We so admire you. We admire you. It's huge. Thank you. Which it's huge. Always you have it's, done. It's, yeah. It's Ooh. really yeah. It's been really great. Thank God. We're really We're very, very impressed. It's like, so exciting. It's so exciting that you're there. Like, yes, Etta. Can you hear me? Just, oh. a, just a question. Um, yes. Can you use almond flavoring, you know, the little almond extract? I know we don't use nuts on Rosh Hashanah, but can we oh, use interesting. extract or not? I that's think so. One. But you that's should ask one. somebody. You can ask okay. somebody. I would just because it's you're not eating a nut. You wouldn't say a blessing over that, um, okay. and it's okay. not identifiable as just like a te as a taste. I thought so it was I, only the one nuts we cannot eat. So I should take all the nuts. Some people say it's all, Some people say um, just walnuts because those are egozim specifically. But some say all nuts. Um, okay, but, maybe that's good for my diet. But peanuts okay. are peanuts are fine uh, because they're not nuts. They're legumes. Okay, so I'll take all the nuts out Thank and you. I'll have more room. <laughs> Check with your family, Gabby. Check with your family. No, no, it's, you it's, it's good. I'm the one. Oh, you got muted. Can you hear me now, Ellen? Yes, Selena. Hi. So, Dina, I'm so excited. Is this your first Rosh Hashanah in Israel? I We were in Israel a number of years ago for Rosh Hashanah, but it's our first one here as Israelis. Oh. That's right. so nice. Well, I hope it's very, very special. I remember being in Harnath for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, and it was incredible. The men walking around in their talisim because everything was yeah. white with the cream stone, and it was so atmospheric and very special. So I so hope you get to experience that. Thank yeah. you. So Dean is studying at seminary. She arrived on September 3rd. The wow. Midrash at Tehila. So... Um, you know, Where they is have that? to go places for Shabbat. It's in Harnof. It's on the Neve campus. Oh, okay. So um, anyway, so anyway, so I'll email you. But yeah, um, it, it's very exciting. And, um, you know, they've had a very good first week. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's wonderful. so nice. But, How old is she? Yeah, she's 18. Wow. Good for her. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Very it's very um, nice. So Baruch Hashem. Well, I wish you a chasiva chasima tova, and thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you so much, and same to you and your family. All right. We'll see you next week. God willing. Bezrat Hashem. All right. Shana tova. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.